have dementia are demented. <laughs> and so I think it's okay to talk about demented people. What I'm going to tell you about is a very special journey that happened here at UCSF that begins in 1972 and really is continuing up to the present. So we'll start with this slide, and I'm assured the lights will go down. So I'm going to tell you about a saga that represents the triumph of scientific investigation over prejudice. It's really a journey from heresy to orthodoxy. It's about prions, really a new principle of infection and disease. Now, the diseases we're going to talk about are Kuru of New Guinea natives, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease called CJD, Gerstmann stories are Shanker disease and fatal insomnia, then scrapie of sheep, mad cow disease or BSE of cattle, and chronic wasting disease of mule deer and elk. Now, it was 1972, as I mentioned to you a moment ago, that I became interested in these diseases. And I had a patient from Marin County, a 60-year-old woman who was dying of Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. I was a resident in neurology here. And as I began to learn about the animal disorder scrapie and about the 4A people in New Guinea who suffered of Kuru, I thought this could be really a fascinating area to pursue. And really the fascination came from the chemical point of view because there were a few tidbits of chemistry that suggested that the particles causing these diseases must be much different than anything that was known. This is a slide by my colleague Steve DeArmond showing you what the brain looks like of a patient who typically dies of Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. It's a rare disease, about one person in a million or one in every 10,000 deaths. This is a much less common form with these huge vacuoles that you see. You have to excuse my voice. Uh, that's, this is a virus causing it, not prions. <laughs> now, for many years, scientists thought that scrapie <coughs> was caused by a virus because the disease is transmissible, the agent is small and filterable, there's a rise in scrapie agent titer that precedes disease, so that's the concentration or amount of scrapie agent, and there are different strains of scrapie agent that produce different patterns of disease. So there was a lot known when we got into this. Now what I thought in 1972 was that what we really needed to do was to develop a method to isolate the infectious particles. So the infectious particles in this cartoon are represented by these little red squares and everything else is junk. And we needed to separate these so we could understand what they were made of. Well, the problem became that the particles did not behave very well. So instead of having a very steep curve here, the curve was very, uh, very gradual. I won't go into the details of some of the more difficult pieces of the science. But this shows it a little more easily. So the ideal behavior of a particle, whether it's a virus or a protein or a piece of nucleic acid, whatever you might want to isolate, it would, when we fractionate it, have a bit one peak that looks like that. But instead what we found was that the scrapie agent was spread throughout the entire uh, gradient. Now, the problem was compounded by the fact that when I started, we needed to use 60 mice, and we needed one year to carry out what was called an endpoint titration. And all the red ones are positives, and all the white ones are negative. So what we would use are 60 mice, as I said, uh, for a single sample. So at each tenfold dilution, we would have six mice. And this assay took a year. Now, we were able in the late 1970s to develop a new assay. And this was based on the work of Richard Marsh in Wisconsin and Richard Kimberlin, who was working with Richard Marsh, but who was from England. And we turned to the hamsters. We followed their lead. And we were able to reduce the number of animals from 
60 down to 4, and the time from about 130 days for high titered samples to 70 days. And we did this by constructing a standardized curve and then just simply reading the dose off of the curve. And since we were interested in making more and more enriched preparations, this worked to our advantage because we didn't have to wait to get this endpoint where we had the negatives and the positives after a whole year. We could just simply read off the titer or the concentration from this standard curve. This was a huge step. It allowed us to do more experiments in a period of three years than had been done in the entire field over a previous century. Now, as I said to you a moment ago, isolating the scrapie agent was a nightmare because it behaved very oddly and also because the method of measurement when we entered the field was extremely difficult. One year and 60 animals. So, having now moved away from mice into hamsters, able to accelerate our studies by a nearly a hundred fold. So what we could do in one year would have taken us a century to do. And there are few investigators that live a century, much less have a productive lifetime of a century. So now what we could do is develop what's called a purification scheme. So we could use detergents and enzymes and back to the centrifuge and these gradients. And now we could follow up the lead that was present in the literature from a woman named Tig Valper, who was a radiobiologist working in, the, in England. And she had argued that because the scrapie agent was so resistant to UV and ionizing radiation, that it did not contain RNA or DNA, nucleic acid. And what we found was that all the procedures we used that alter nucleic acids did not diminish the infectivity. And the procedures that modified proteins led to an activation of the scrapie agent. But we could only see this after we removed more than 99% of the junk, the unwanted molecules. And having done that, and that's me, by the way, with brown hair at the time, uh, I thought that by 1982, actually the spring of 81, that we had enough information to say that this particle was not a virus or a tiny nucleic acid called a viroid discovered by Ted Diener in the late 1960s, and that we needed to give it a new name. And so I had the audacity to call these particles prions. That's the long arm of the scientific community pushing on me. And people say, well, what do those people look like? And here they are at a table. <laughs> That's my best slide. You can go home now. Uh, and it became very, very clear that prions eventually became very clear are infectious proteins. Now I'm going to take you through a lot more evidence that builds the case that prions are infectious proteins. And then as we move through this, uh, we'll get to some very new data and we'll talk about BSE and we'll talk about other prion diseases of humans. And then at the end, we'll talk about therapies and there'll be a lot of chemistry at the end but it won't be complicated. Because if I put the chemistry in the beginning, you'll all leave. <laughs> so here we have this purification scheme where we remove 99% of the unwanted particles. We then knew that a protein was important, and we went on to identify and find this protein. And then the next thing we did was to try to determine whether we could separate this protein from the infectivity. And so we used a lot of approaches. So we're now measuring the biological activity in hamsters. And we're looking at the protein by physical methods. And we tried to separate it. And what we found is that every time we destroyed the protein, we destroyed the infectivity. Or every time we destroyed the infectivity, the protein was removed or just destroyed. And when we eventually figured out what was going on, we found that there was a normal form of the protein in all of us. Now this is a, a gel, and the proteins migrate, and the smaller they are, the faster they migrate through this gel, this porous material, sort of like jello. And then we can stain them with antibodies. And so what we found was that the protein was a protein in all of us, which is a normal form of the prion protein. And when we treat with enzymes that destroy proteins, the protein was completely destroyed. 
But in the brains of these hamsters that became ill with scrapie, what we found was that there was both a normal form of the protein and another form of the protein that when we treated with enzymes that destroy proteins, there was a residual piece. And here they're higher ordered multimers, so they're, they're larger forms where that are aggregated of the scrapie causing protein. And eventually, the protein that I just showed you in the gel after we treated with proteases, what we did was to use a lot of very um, complicated equipment in collaboration with a man named Leroy Hood who was at Caltech at the time, and Darlene Groth who has been working with me for 25 years, uh, went to Caltech over a period of a year about seven different times and we finally were able to uh, work out what's called the amino acid sequence, the N-terminal 15 amino acids, so right in this region. Now this was more complicated because it was ragged because we'd thrown in these proteases. But what we had found, of course, is that if we threw the proteases into the normal uh, preparations, there was nothing. Well, now we had the possibility of doing what's called reverse genetic engineering, and we went backwards and with Charles Weissman in Zurich, we found the gene that codes for the prion protein, and we found that all of us have this gene. And it became very clear that all of us have the normal form of the prion protein, and then by a process that we still don't understand in great detail, it can be converted into a protein which is infectious and which can eventually kill us as human beings or kill animals like the cattle in Europe. So now we knew that there was a gene for the protein of the prion, um, and the protein of the prion we called PRP scrapie, and, it's, and that this gene encodes the precursor protein PRPC. There's a mistake here. It's not found, it's only found in sick mammals, but the gene is found in all mammals. Uh, so now we had two proteins, the precursor protein PRPC that we all have, a normal protein, and the protein found in the animals that were ill with prion disease. We did another set of experiments and we asked, what about the messenger RNA? So the messenger RNA is the intermediate between the gene and the protein. And we said, well, the messenger RNA ought to rise as, the, as these animals go out toward the, these are now mice that get sick at 130 days, as the incubation time gets longer and longer and the tighter the prions goes up, the messenger RNA ought to rise. But in fact, the messenger RNA stayed exactly the same. It never changed. And this worried us a little bit. Were we looking at the right protein? But we got lucky because using that same technology, genetic engineering, we now looked at black mice or brown mice and we looked at these white mice. And the white mice had long incubation times, about 225 days, the short ones about 130 days. And what we found was that this gene, the prion protein gene that I've been talking about, determined whether the mice had a short incubation time or a long incubation time. And the mice with long incubation times had two amino acids out of 250 that were different. And so this began to cement the idea that this protein, PRP, that we had discovered was key in the disease process. So what I've told you is that not only did the prion protein track with scraping infectivity, so every time we tried to alter the protein, we altered the infectivity and vice versa, but also amino acid substitutions changed the incubation times. So these findings link the phenotype which is called the disease characteristics in this case, to the genotype, the changes or mutations in the DNA. Now we come to a whole different approach. And we spent six years here at UCSF trying to identify the difference between PRPC, the normal form of the protein that all of us have, and the scrapey form of the protein that's found only in the disease. And we looked and looked for a chemical difference, because if we could have found a chemical difference, then it would have been very easy to make that chemical change on PRPC and convert it into PRP scrapey. But we never found it. This was the work of a young postdoc, Neil Stahl, 
who was working with Mike Baldwin, who's still here and who's a professor uh, in the School of Pharmacy of Mass Spectrometry. So then Fred Cohn became involved, and we uh, began to think about models. And the first thing that Fred did, he said, I wonder if this isn't really the case that the normal form of the prion protein is full of these helical structures called alpha helices, and that some of these are reduced, and that there's a lot of beta sheet, these beta strands, these blue ribbons. And at that point, uh, what we did was we knew that there was a lot of beta structure from other studies, from our own work and from that of other people. We went off and purified out of brains of animals the normal form of the prion protein. And we found that Fred, in fact, was correct, that there was very little beta structure. And then more recently, Tom James and his colleagues here, with the help of Peter Wright and Jane Dyson at Scripps, uh, from took protein that was made by genetic engineering in bacteria and determined its structure. So here we're sort of halfway through the protein around residue 90, and then you see this long unstructured region, then one, the first alpha helix, then more of this unstructured region with a small amount of beta structure, then the second helix and the third helix, and what's called the C-terminus. Now what we hypothesized was that the first helix, and in fact, we thought the first helix was made up of two, this whole region was made up of two helices, and we were wrong, and, and Kurt Vutrick in Zurich showed us that we were wrong, uh, much to our dislike and unhappiness. Um, and so this was the model that we had for a number of years. So what I've just told you is that when PRPC is converted into PRP scrapie, the protein undergoes a profound change in shape, or as scientists call it, conformation. PRPC is rich in alpha helix, whereas PRP scrapie is rich in beta structure. And we went on to do some studies uh, in collaboration with Dennis Burton at Scripps. And this is the work of David Peretz, who's still here at UCSF. And what we did was to make antibodies that reacted to different regions of the prion protein. So this is the three helix protein. This is helix A, helix B, and helix C that I showed you before. And this is residue 90. And in this first region, the, uh, the prion protein uh, binds antibodies. And the native form of the prion protein binds them quite well. But the binding region, or epitope, disappears when PRP scrapie is formed. So that was an important discovery. And we used that information and we contrasted that with the green where both the native form of PRPC and the native form of PRP scrapie bind antibodies. That's down here. So these epitopes or regions of the alpha helix rich precursor protein PRPC of prions are exposed but become buried when the protein is refolded into an infectious form, PRP scrapie. Now, when we treat with proteases and we cleave off the N-terminal region and we form the ragged N-terminus that I showed you that we sequenced, and we call this PRP2730, this protein, and this is the one that I showed you before where we've treated with protease, so it's a little bit shorter, that protein polymerizes into these rod-shaped structures that you see here. And there was a very famous man at Berkeley who died about 15 years ago, Ropley Williams, who was really the father of the electron microscopy of viruses. And he was working with us at the time because I really thought we, we were going to find an interesting virus, not a protein. And we would see these rod-shaped structures, and he called them rods. Some people would call them fibrils. And one day, I guess we had been working together for almost a year and a half. I was looking at a book on the electron microscopy of proteins, and all of this looked like amyloid proteins. Now, amyloid was a, is a mammalian protein. These are usually pathologically uh, laid down in big fibrils. And there are many, many diseases like Alzheimer's disease where there are amyloid plaques. So many of these proteins. But it turned out that this pro that what we were seeing was that the protein of the prion was forming amyloid, and that's what these rods represent. 
and then it formed plaques in the brain, and I'll show you some of those plaques a little later. Now, we also found, and this is the work of Hol Holger Willey, who's here at UCSF, along with the help of David Agard and many others, uh, Hannes Serban, uh, Darlene Groth, that the protein forms these rods, and then at one end, we sometimes see these two-dimensional crystals. And we don't know whether the crystals form first, and from that, the rods form, or the rods began to dissolve, and we form the crystals on the surface. But we were able to use those images of the crystals, and then do what's called correlation averaging. And then we can average some more. So these are all imaging techniques. And we can develop these power spectra and get very, very detailed images. And so we went through a lot of this. And we eventually were able to show that a piece of the prion protein in the middle of the protein is found in the center in these black regions. And that the sugar chains are found around the edges of the black regions. And that gave rise to two different models, what we call a trimer of dimers, so there are six here, or simply a trimer, as shown here. And this is, this is the right-handed model, this is the left-handed model. And here you simply see one of these now, it's a much different looking structure for the model of PRP Scrapey. It has what are called beta helices, so this beta structure is now in a helix this is an alpha helix. This is a beta helix. This is PRPC, as I talked about earlier, with helix A, helix B, and helix C. Here you see part of helix B preserved and all of helix C preserved, and the rest of this now is changed into a beta helix. This is the current model. This is how we're thinking about this. It may or may not be right. And the way we obtain this these images was using what we call the old electron microscope, which means it's no longer in service, but I'd simply show you this. And now what we're doing is working with a new uh, microscope, which was uh, purchased with the help of the Fairchild Foundation. This is a $2 million instrument. And you can begin to see all of this new detail that wasn't there in the last slide. So you can see that it's really essentially blank. And now we begin to see all kinds of information. So we're very optimistic that this will yield much more structure in the near future. So prions are composed of prion proteins that are rich in beta structure. And we don't know whether this is beta helix or beta sheet, but all of the evidence so far argues for this new model of beta helix. When the prion protein, PRPC, is synthesized, it's made deep in the cell in what is called the endoplasmic reticulum. And then it travels through what is called the Golgi apparatus out to the surface. And on the surface, in these what are called rafts or cholesterol-rich microdomains, uh, where there's a lot of cholesterol on the surface in, in these little regions, uh, the normal form of the prion protein, PRPC, is converted into PRP scrapie. And then it travels deep into the cell again and all the way down into what are called lysosomes, where, these, where proteins are normally degraded, but PRP scrapie persists. But it doesn't persist forever, as I'll show you in a little bit later, and it's changed the way we think about this. So the precursor of the prion is an alpha helix rich protein, PRPC, that's synthesized in what's called the ER or endoplasmic reticulum of the cell. The infectious form of the prion protein, PRP scrapie of the prion, is rich in beta structure, and it is formed from PRPC on the surface of the cell in these cholesterol-rich microdomains. Now, recently we discovered that the prion protein was around a long, long time ago, and that it has a cousin, actually a sister or a brother. It was an ancient gene duplication before men and mice diverged. And with the help of Lee Hood and David Westaway, who was here at the time, and later Richard Moore, who came from Edinburgh, and Patrick Tremblay, uh, who came from Montreal, we were able to unravel this mystery. So here's the prion protein gene, and 16,000 bases downstream, 
we predicted there was a new gene which we, for the doppel protein. And when we began to look at this gene, it became clear that there were many common features and that helix A existed in both, helix B existed in both, and helix C existed in both. But there were differences. When we looked at individual amino acids one by one, there were only 25% that shared uh, sequence homology, that were identical. But when we looked at the structure, and this is with the work of Jane Dyson and Peter Wright and their postdoc Wapping Mo at Scripps, comparing this to the structure done in Zurich by Kurt Vutrich that I mentioned earlier. So this is mouse doppel and mouse PRP. So what you see is that over time, the structures were preserved. Here's helix A, helix A, helix B, helix C, helix B, and helix C. And yet, the sequences diverged enormously. 75% of the residues are different, but the overall structures are extremely similar. We don't know what either of these proteins does. We don't know the function of either protein. Now let's turn to the human prion diseases for a moment. The sporadic form of these diseases is called Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. And this accounts for 85% of all prion disease. The inherited forms uh, account for 10 to 15 percent and are called Gerstmann Stroys or Schenker disease, familial CJD, and fatal familial insomnia. These are autosomal dominant diseases, so half of the family members are afflicted if they live long enough. And the infectious forms of these diseases are very rare, and they include Kuru among New Guinea natives that was transmitted by ritualistic cannibalism. Iatrogenic Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease caused by growth hormone derived from human pituitaries. And I'll talk much more about new variant CJD in Britain. Sporadic CJD is a disease of older people. So the peak is around 70 years of age. This is Larry Schoenberger's data from the CDC. It's a 20-year experience in the United States. So very few young people develop sporadic CJD. Now the Genetic forms of this disease have a fascinating history because the first reports of Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease were in 1921, and 10 years later, the first pedigree was drawn of familial CJD. And in 1973, Ray Roos, who's currently the chair of neurology at the University of Chicago, working with Carlton Gajasek and Joe Gibbs at the NIH, who did all the early work on Kuru, and all the transmission work on Kuru and CJD into apes and monkeys, uh, they, three of them wrote a paper, and they reported the first familial cases transmitted into non-human primates. They offered three explanations. First, that the CJD virus, as they thought it was in 1973, they thought it was a virus, was transmitted among family members living in close proximity. Second, there was a genetic predisposition to a ubiquitous CJD virus that was everywhere, like the ether. And third, like in AIDS, there was vertical transmission of the CJD virus from parent to offspring. So it turned out that all three explanations were wrong. And in 1989, Karen Chow, who had just finished her neurology residency here and came to work with me as a postdoctoral fellow, identified the first gene mutation in the PRP gene in a patient who had died of uh, GSS at UCLA. And from that, it became very clear that this mutant form of PRPC refolds into PRP scrapie. Now, subsequent to this, it became a whole, this became an industry. And there are more than 30 gene mutations that have been identified, all of them above the line here, that cause these inherited forms of the disease. We've also identified what are called polymorphisms. And those are shown below the line, this one right here and this one right here in sheep protect people from CJD or from scrapie. And we've been doing a lot of drug development uh, with Fred Cohn and one of his uh, postdoctoral fellows, Barney May. Now let me turn to prions in mad cows and the transmission to people, which has really created a public health crisis that threatens the food supply as well as the blood supply worldwide. Just yesterday, Poland joined the countries of the BSE club for the first case. 
Now, we believe that BSE arose through industrial cannibalism in the late 1970s. And there's an argument whether it arose spontaneously in a cow, perhaps a mutation, or it came from sheep where scrapie is endemic. But nevertheless, it recycled through cows and then into humans. Here's a typical newspaper <laughs> clipping. And it's not only a British problem. This is also a problem throughout the continent. And while there are over 100 cases of new variant CJD in young people in Britain, there are now four cases in France. This is the BSE epidemic that begins in 1986 with the discovery of the, the disease by Gerald Wells. It peaks around 1992 with 40, 000, almost 40,000 cases, and then the number of cases keep declining. But we keep finding more and more cases because more and more sensitive assays are being used, or measurement techniques, to detect the prions. All of these animals were clinically ill after then at least 36 months of age. This represents, and these, these little balls or uh, circles are, represent one case, whereas each square represents 1,000 cases on, this, on, the X, on the Y axis. So what we're seeing is that there is this con continuous increase in the number of cases per year. This is the yearly numbers of new variant CJD, except in 2001, the numbers down here. What it'll be in 2002, we don't know. So we see that this disease appears about a decade after the beginning of BSE, so we think the incubation time exceeds one decade. And in, from Kuru studies, we know it can be up to four decades. This is an MRI scan, and it shows, uh, if we didn't have that light on over there, you could see this much better, this hyperdensities and what is caudate, and all the way down into the pulvinar, which is the which is this dorsal nucleus of the thalamus. Uh, and this is called a hockey stick sign. And that's very typical of patients with new variant CJD. Patients with sporadic CJD have all these hyperintensities that are seen bilaterally, but they don't have the lighting up of the pulvinar. I said I would show you some of these amyloid plaques, and in patients with new variant CJD, and this is the work of Steve DeArmond again, uh, with slides sent to, uh, I should say, sections sent to us by Bob Will and Jim Ironside in Edinburgh. So these are the plaques surrounded by this halo of spongiform degeneration. They stain with antibodies to the prion protein uh, very intensely. I've already said this seven times. Now, one wanted to try to figure out where did all of this start? Did it really start in sheep? Did it start in cows? And did it come from the cows to the humans? And if we were looking for a virus, we could do this very easily. The virus would be simple to track because the virus would have a nucleic acid, a piece of DNA or RNA, and we could easily uh, track it into the sheep and see that it had nothing to do with the sheep, but that same uh, piece of DNA or RNA appeared in the cow and then appeared in the human. We can't do that. So what we had to do was really begin to look at what are called prion strains. And what's happening is that PRP scrapie, signified by a square, is stimulating the conversion of bovine PRPC, this is from the sheep, into PRP scrapie of the cow. And the same thing, we can reiterate this into the human. Now, there's a lot of data, but I'm only going to show you very little. And what we did was to use transgenic mice to investigate the origin of BSE and the transmission of prions to humans. There's now compelling evidence that indicates that prions in beef products were ingested by humans who later developed variant CJD. What we began with, and this is Jim Mastriani's work uh, and Glenn Telling's work, was a, what we call a humanized mouse. So now this mouse behaves toward prions like a human being. And when we take sporadic CJD or familial CJD and transmit into the mice brain extracts from people who've died of these diseases, all of the mice get sick in about 200 days. But when we took new variant CJD from young people in England, people in their early 20s or late teens, we found that 
about 25%, this is wrong, it's not 60%, but about 25% of the mice became ill by 500 days. And when we took brain extracts from cows with BSE, none of the mice developed disease by 600 days. Now Mike Scott did an experiment why, where he created bovinized mice. So these are mice that behave like cows with respect to prions. And when he took mad cows brain, 240 days and all the mice were sick. With new variant CJD, what he found was that 100% of the mice developed disease at 260 days after inoculation. So this was quite a shock. And that when we took sheep scrapie from the United States, the mice were even more susceptible. 210 days, 100% were sick. And when we looked at the neuropathology, again, Steve DeArmond's work, what Steve found was that if we began with sheep scrapie, there was very little of the prion protein deposited in what's called the corpus callosum, the structure that connects both sides of your brain. And this, some people with intractable epilepsy, this structure is cut. When we looked, if we began with BSE in these bovinized mice, we saw large amounts of the prion protein deposited in these big plaques. And if we took new variant CJD, the image was indistinguishable. So when we put all this together, the indistinguishable neuropathology, the very similar incubation times, it became very clear that there was little doubt that the people had become sick from the cows. And that's in addition to all the human epidemiology showing the disease is confined largely to Great Britain with four cases in France, as I said, one in Italy and one in Ireland. And now there's actually one in the United States, but this is a woman who, 22 years, old, 22 years old, living in Florida, who lived in Great Britain for nearly 10 years, and is a British citizen. So all of this put together, Mike Scott began to think about this in a slightly different way. And he's begun to wonder if, in fact, all sheep with scrapie prions, the blue ones, also have a few BSE prions that multiply more slowly. And that what happened in the late 1970s was that when they reduced the temperature and also the process, made it less severe, uh, what they called the rendering process, the scrapie prions were still destroyed, but the BSE prions survived. And now they multiplied in cattle where they became pathogenic for humans and there were no more scrapie prions, the blue ones, to hold down the amount of the red ones that could be made. Excuse me, whether that's true or not, I don't know. So this is a hypothesis and we're trying to pursue this. So variant CJD is caused by prions in beef products from mad cows. Over 85% of all human prion diseases are sporadic, 10 to 15% are inherited. So I just want to point out that while there are about 5,000 cases of CJD across the planet each year, we're talking about 25 cases of variant CJD so far. So just to give you a little perspective on the numbers. Let's now turn to therapeutic approaches to prion diseases. So there are a large number of approaches that we've taken here at UCSF, and I won't talk about rational drug design based upon what is called dominant negative inhibition or gene therapy. And I'm also not going to talk about what is called enhanced clearance, but I'll come back to talk a little bit about clearance of prions. I am going to talk about antibodies that were used to inhibit prion replication, and then I'm going to talk about a drug called quinacrine that we're giving to patients in a study with Bruce Miller and Michael Geschwind and many, many other people here at UCSF. So this is David Peretz's work using these antibodies produced by Dennis Burton and Anthony Williamson at Scripps. Uh, and again, the same blue antibodies react out here, more toward the N terminus, the green ones at the C terminus, and the red ones in the middle region. That's helix A, helix B, helix C. All of this looks a little complicated, but let's just look over here at this graph. So we're adding increasing amounts of antibody to cultured cells, and we're seeing the decrease in the amount of PRP scrapie, the protein of the prion. And the red antibodies work better than the blue antibodies, but only a little bit. But both red and blue work much better than the green antibodies. 
And if we look here, now instead of having the concentration of antibody, it's the duration of antibody treatment. So we picked one concentration of antibody. And now what we've done, and you see that the red ones work quite rapidly compared to the blue ones. And what this allows us to do is to look at when we see a half maximal decrease, when we've gone down 50%. And that's about at this point, at about 30 hours, right in here. And in 1990, uh, Bruce Cheesebro and Byron Coey, working at the Rocky Mountain Laboratory, did a lot of work on the synthesis of PRPC and defined what is called the half-life for formation, very rapid. And David Borchelt, working here in San Francisco, uh, confirmed that and then showed that the half-life time for degradation is about six hours. And that PRP scrapey was made even more slowly with a half time of formation of about three to 10 hours. Now, I had thought that PRP scrapey was complete granite and that it was never degraded. But in the last slide that I showed you, this is really represents the degradation of PRP scrapey, the loss of prions from the culture. And so we were able to calculate a number, as I mentioned before, where 50% of the PRP scrapey disappears of about 30 hours. This has important implications for our thinking about all degenerative diseases. It tells us that cells are capable of degrading both PRPC and PRP scrapey. And it raises the question whether PRP scrapey is normally found at very low levels in normal cells and has a physiological function. And that is a very appealing way of thinking about all of this because it makes much more sense than thinking that PRP scrapey is something totally aberrant. It raises the question of whether or not we really have an issue, it's a kinetic race between the formation of PRP scrapey and the cell's ability to clear PRP scrapey. And that when the cell can keep up with the formation and clear it, like it does with other protein, all other proteins in fact, at that when that happens, everything is functioning fine. But when the cell gets out of balance, it can no longer clear PRP scrapey at the rate that it's formed. Now we're talking about very, very low levels that we can't detect even by these animal assays. Uh, then something goes awry, and we begin to accumulate more and more PRP scrapey, and eventually the animal gets sick and goes on to die, or the human being. Now, I promised you a little chemistry at the end. And if you just look down here at chlorpromazine, this is Thorazine. This is one of the first antipsychotic drugs, and this is the structure of it. It has these three rings. And when Karsten Korth added one micromolar, this amount, he still saw these protease-resistant bands. This, so the, different, the three bands are the ones with no sugars, one sugar chain, and two sugar chains. They're shown a little better here. So two sugar chains, one, and none, or up, even up in here. When he added f five times as much chlorpromazine, he couldn't see any, and 10 times as much, he still couldn't see any, as you would expect. And when he had done the first experiments and showed them to me, I said, go back and look at some of these other psychoactive drugs, like haloperidol, which doesn't do anything in similar concentrations. And he did that. And he looked at many of them, as you see on this chart. And then I said to him, Karsten, why in the world did you come with me to the ch show me the first experiments? And what it, the background of Karsten Korth was that he, in his late 30s, had done a psychiatry residency and decided he wanted to go into molecular biology and began to work with a former postdoctoral fellow of mine, Bruno Ursch, in Zurich. And when Bruno uh, left the University of Zurich to start a biotech company. Karsten wanted to stay in academic medicine and came here. And I had been telling Karsten for about a year and a half that he should solve one of the major problems of psychiatry, like schizophrenia or bipolar disorders or autism. <laughs> and he looked at me and, he, and to answer my question, why did you do these experiments? And he said, well, you've been telling me to connect my work on prions with psychiatry for two years now. And so I threw in chlorpromazine or Thorazine into the culture. Well, to Karsten's credit, he went back and began to look at the literature in detail. 
And all of this really begins with the German dye industry and Paul Ehrlich in 1891 who was using methylene blue as a weak anti-malarial substance. And then through this pathway, eventually these, these more potent anti-malarials were synthesized and chlorpromazine, which really had marked antipsychotic effects. And chlorpromazine was the first drug to begin to empty out the insane asylums throughout the world. In the 1930s, the Germans synthesized quinacrine, and this turned out to be a potent anti-malarial drug, but had many more side effects than quinine. But quinine, there wasn't enough quinine for use in World War II because it's extracted from the bark of the chacona tree, and there wasn't a chemist in the world who was smart enough to figure out the structure and then how to synthesize it until Robert Woodward did this at Harvard in the late 1940s. So quinacrine was given to thousand, I should say, three million young Americans in World War II. So we know a lot about quinacrine pharmacology. And what Karsten Korth found was that quinacrine was ten times more potent than chlorpromazine. So each, so instead of this being a ten, that being a five, that's a one and point five and point one, and the structure is very similar. And when Karsten Korth treated these cultures for six days, if he added enough chlorpromazine, he found that there was no return of these protease-resistant bands. This is, this is the band, as I said before, that has two sugar chains, one, and none. And because quinacrine has a 70-year history of the treatment of parasitic diseases, and the toxicities are well documented, Bruce Miller and Michael Geshwin and I and a number of other people have been involved in this in the School of Pharmacy here. Um, we applied for an IND, a new drug uh, investigation license from the FDA, and we were able to skip what are called phases one and two of these typical clinical trials, which amount to uh, tens of millions of dollars normally. And we began to load patients with one gram, followed by 300 milligrams daily. And in a minority of patients, what we've seen, we believe, and it's not just us, it's many neurologists who are in contact with us throughout the world, but we've not seen all these patients because we're hoping that we will get an NIH study funded over the next uh, four or five months and that this study will provide us the funding we need to really look at all of the patients uh, throughout the world who are on quinacrine. But it's our impression and that of a number of other neurologists that in the minority of CJD patients, the disease is slowed by quinacrine. And in a few CJD patients with quinacrine who have died later, Steve Diarmidis found that there are lower levels of PRP scrapey. They seem to be reduced ex to almost zero. Uh, compared to what is generally found. Now the problem is that we have so few patients in this group where we've been able to obtain these autopsies that we just don't know at this point. The second issue is that in addition to not knowing, uh, there are some patients uh, where we even have more doubts. These are the patients who get dramatically better on quinacrine. And those patients, I think as good scientists, we're not even sure that they have CJD. So we need a much more controlled study. We don't want to fool ourselves. So what I've been telling you tonight is that sporadic and infectious forms of these diseases, it's the wild type or normal form of PRPC that's converted into PRP scrapey. So this is an in infectious form of the disease. There's transmission from an animal to a man or from man to man or animal to animal. In the sporadic form of the disease, it counts for 90, 85 to 90 percent of all cases we think it's a spontaneous conversion of PRPC into PRP scrapey, or as I told you before, this is a kinetic race, and that there are small amounts of PRP scrapey in all of us that are normally cleared. In the inherited forms of these diseases, it's a germline mutation passed from parent to offspring. There are a whole series of new ideas that have come out of this. The fact that, the, that prions are infectious proteins is totally new. This is unlike all other infectious agents. Prions cause brain degeneration. 
They cause sporadic, genetic, and infectious forms of these diseases. There's no other disease paradigm in which you have both genetic and infectious diseases. And prions are the most well understood among all the neurodegenerative diseases, which include, of course, Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, which are many thousands of times more common than the prion diseases. Now, it's the discovery of prions and many other new findings which allows us now, I think, to define neurodegenerative diseases in terms of their cause, not the effect. So we could, I think we all, most people would agree now that degenerative diseases of the nervous system are disorders of aberrant protein processing. So the proteins are being processed abnormally. Now give me a little idea of the numbers of cases in the United, so we have 400 cases of prion disease annually in the US, but there are 4 million people with Alzheimer's disease, about a million with Parkinson's disease, and about 20,000 with ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. So these are huge numbers. Now, there are many, many similarities between these diseases. What we see are these abnormal protein deposits. I showed you PRP scrapie in the brain, and I showed you these PRP amyloid plaques. Well, the brains look very similar if we're not using, if we use antibodies, but we, these are different proteins now, but the structures look very similar in Alzheimer's disease. They're slightly different in Parkinson's disease and ALS. But what's so interesting about all of these is that the mutations in the genes that we find in familial forms of the disease encode the proteins that are found in these protein deposits, except here this is less clear with ALS. So the accumulation of misprocessed proteins causes the nervous system to malfunction, resulting in problems such as dementia, we're back to this word, Alan, difficulty moving, and weakness. And preventing the accumulation of these misprocessing protein provi proteins provides, I think, for the first time, a rational approach to treating degenerative diseases of the nervous system. Now, this is a little summary of CJD and what went on. As I told you, I, my introduction to this was a patient in 1972 here at UCSF, and that it was 1921 when six patients were described and this disease was thrown into a wastebasket of degenerative disorders of the nervous system. But it came out of the wastebasket in 1968 when Carlton Gajasek and Joe Gibbs, working at the NIH, along with a number of collaborators, transmitted the disease into apes and later into monkeys. Prions are unlike all other infectious pathogens, viruses, viroids, bacteria, fungi, parasites, all of which multiply by having an RNA or DNA genome direct the synthesis of progeny pathogens. It's only prions which contain only a protein, and they co-opt the normal form of that protein to produce more of the misfolded form, PRP scrapie. Now, all of this, I, what I'm telling you, seemed like science fiction to a lot of people. And about seven or eight years ago, I was at a meeting in New Mexico, and I was hearing everything that I, was been, I had been saying, but it was being said by somebody else. And I looked at a good friend of mine, Hillary Kaprowski, and I said, Hillary, this is really unbelievable. This guy even thinks he'd found all of this. And Hillary said, I've got a slide for you. I'll send it to you. So he sent me this slide about the four stages of adopting a new idea. The reaction at first is it's impossible. Second, maybe it's possible, but it's weak and uninteresting. Third, it's true and I told you so. And the fourth one you can read. <laughs> now, there's another way of thinking about this. And Lou Thomas, who uh, was the director at Sloan Kettering in New York for many years, was also a brilliant writer. And in a book called Lives of the Cell in 1974, he wrote an essay about research. And this is a, these are a couple paragraphs. Somehow the atmosphere has to be set so that a disquieting sense of being wrong is the normal attitude of the investigators. It has to be taken for granted that the only way in is by riding the unencumbered human imagination with the special rigor required for recognizing that something can be highly improbable, maybe almost impossible, and at the same time true. Locally, a good way to tell how the work is going is to listen in the corridors. 
If you hear the word impossible spoken with an expletive, followed by laughter, you will know somebody's orderly research plan is coming along nicely. <laughs> now, that's a lot of words, and if you're Winston Churchill, you can describe all this in many fewer words. This is 1936 in the House of Parliament. He's talking to Stanley Baldwin about Hitler invading the Rhineland, and he says to Stanley Baldwin in the House of Commons, men occasionally stumble across the truth, but most pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing had happened. And with that, I'll end. Thank you. So the question is, do prions trigger the immune system? And the answer is no. And the reason that we think that they don't is that PRPC uh, is present in all of us. And we are tolerant to antibodies that's, and, and also to immune cells that specifically recognize PRPC. And there are very few regions on PRP scraping. In fact, we've not been able to identify any, looking for more than 10 years now, uh, that are present on PRP scrapie to which antibodies are formed that are not present on PRPC. We found others, as I told you about before, where a region is exposed on PRPC but now becomes buried in PRP scrapie, but that doesn't generate a new antigenic region to which there can be an immune response. And in fact, a tremendous step forward in making all of these antibodies was created when uh, a collaborative study that we were involved in with Charles Weissman in Zurich produced knockout mice in which the prion protein gene of a, of a mouse could be knocked out. These mice are totally resistant to prion disease. And when we immunize these mice with the prion protein, they form huge numbers of antibodies in contrast to normal mice, which form very few or no antibodies. And they form no antibodies if it's the mouse prion protein. If it's a human, they might form one. So the immune system is quiet in these diseases. Well, all right, so the question is very technical. Is the normal form of the prion protein the kinetic product or a kinetically trapped molecule? And that this scrapey form is a thermodynamically more stable protein? And uh, the answer is probably yes, but we're not sure. All right, so the normal form of the prion protein is on the surface, and that's where it's converted into PRP scrapie, and how much of it remains there, we don't know. In some, some experiments by Steve DeArmond, where he fractionates these cells, so he grinds them up and looks for the membrane fraction that's found on the surface, he finds as much as 60% of the scrapey form, the, the abnormal form, is, is in the plasma membrane fraction. Others suggest that it's much less than that, so I don't really know. But he's probably right. So the question is, what is the mechanism of action of quinacrine, and how does it work on patients with CJD and new variant CJD? And the answer is, we don't know. We, initially, I thought what we should do is spend a lot of time, several years probably, to track that down before, and understand it before we, we would do anything further. <clears throat> but when I realized that the concentrations were close, probably only off by a factor of 10 to 50 from what an ideal drug would be, we decided to spend a lot of effort uh, starting giving this to people. Uh, but we're also now st slowly starting to investigate the mechanism of action. I'm sure many other people are doing that, too. All right, so TSE is a term called transmissible spongiform encephalopathy. It's a term I don't particularly like, but maybe that's because other people use it all the time. Um, and the reason I don't like it is that many of these diseases, meant, uh, there's very little spongiform change. Uh, but this is a term that really refers to the diseases caused by prions, specifically. And the other neurodegenerative diseases are not classified as prion diseases or as TSE uh, diseases. Uh, they're classified as neurodegenerative diseases. So for instance, Alzheimer's disease is distinguished from the prion diseases by the fact that it, there's a diff different set of proteins that are involved. And all attempts to really transmit the disease have failed so far. That doesn't mean it won't be transmissible in the proper animal model but they're not, it's not transmissible in a natural setting. But in your definition? I don't, uh, I don't know how the spongiform 
change comes about. Uh, what we find is that the vacuoles, that the more PRP scraping there is, the more vacuolation there is. So there's this correlation between PRP scrape, excuse me, PRP scraping deposition and the vacuoles that are formed. But the mechanism by which the vacuoles are formed, I don't understand. Something happens to the signaling mechanisms in the, in the cells. And uh, whether that happens because PRP scrapie is on the surface or whether it's deep in the cell and it mucks up the, 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 uh, the signaling mechanisms, I don't know. That's a very simplistic answer to a very complicated question, but I can't answer it. So the question is, what is the function of PRP? We all have a gene for PRP. We all make the protein, PRPC, and what is its function? And the answer is we don't know its function, and we don't know the function of its brother or sister, Doppel. We just don't know. No, I have, so the question is, why is it that in Britain, uh, people with new variant CJD are in their teens and early 20s? for the most part, and the answer is we don't have any idea. For a long time, I thought that this was really a clue to the fact that, it was, that the disease was unconnected to the cows, uh, and that there was some other mechanism, but uh, I, I threw that idea away once we had all this transgenic mouse data. Um, and the answer is I don't have any idea why they're so young. I, don't, I just don't know. There is one patient who's 70, another who's 50, but the vast majority of these people are under 40. So the first part of this question is, uh, how did this all start in cows? And the second question is, uh, how, do you, how do prions make it to your brain from your gut? Uh, so how did prion disease start? And I think most people were reasonably well convinced that it began with sheep because scrapie is endemic in Britain. It's been there for hundreds of years, and that it came from the sheep. Uh, but nobody knows the exact statistics. Pe people who are farmers tend to get rid of their animals when they're not doing well. And the easiest way to get rid of them is to get them into the human food chain, not to uh, <laughs> burn them up, because you don't get any money for that. Uh, so we don't know how many scrapie sheep enter the human food chain every year in Britain. Uh, we have scrapie in the United States, too. Uh, then there was a huge inquiry, which you can look up on the internet. If you have nothing better to do, there are 3,500 pages on this question of how did BSE start and what happened afterwards. There was an official inquiry that was created by uh, Tony Blair, and they only allowed the inquiry to go up to the day of his election uh, <laughs> so they could Look at John Majors with severe eyes, but not at Tony Blair. And this, so that's what this does. It goes up to 1996 and begins in the late 1970s in terms of questioning what happened. And in that inquiry, you'll see that they think that it began with a spontaneous or sporadic case of mad cow disease somewhere in southern England. I don't think there's a lot of evidence for that, but that's what they hypothesize. So prions are resistant to proteases, as I showed you, or enzyme digestion, which is what happens to proteins when they enter your gut. Uh, if we take animals and we do a study, we find that we need about a billion times more prions when they're ingested than if you put a needle in the head of the animal and inject them directly into the brain. But nevertheless, if we give the animals enough, if we give them a billion times more orally, then they all get sick. And so we presume the prions now cross the gut, probably in the, in the small intestine, and that they multiply in lymphoid cells, and then they go to the brain through the blood. The other way we think they make it to the brain is that they travel backwards up the nerves of the, of the gut, called the splanchnic nerve bed, into the spinal cord, and then up the spinal cord to the brain. The question is, how, is, how do you disinfect uh, scalpels and other medical instruments uh, because there have been cases where CJD has been transmitted from one patient to another uh, by, this, uh, by this route? And what I was about to say was that uh, 
it's very difficult to uh, properly uh, disinfect instruments. And we're working on this now very hard because we have some new approaches that seem to be very useful. And I'm, I'm, very, I'm very encouraged that soon we'll be able to do this uh, in a much better way than is commonly done. Fortunately, the number of examples of that is still small. Um, but as the number of surgical procedures keeps increasing every year, this may become a bigger and bigger problem. Hopefully we can stop it. The question was, how do these poor cannibals in New Guinea keep on perpetuating their society because if they keep eating each other and they keep getting sick with Kuru, aren't they all going to die out? And the answer is that uh, in the late 1950s, uh, as this was starting to, in fact, at that point, in fact, Kuru was the most common cause of death in women. This was a society that all men would like to have lived in because they never had to do anything. The women did absolutely everything. And uh, at that point, uh, the most common cause of death in, in, in women was Kuru, and they died in, in, in their 30s. Uh, they never, virtually never made it to age 40. So we had generations of young people who were uh, motherless. And it was in the late 1950s that two things happened. One, the missionaries who began to colonize that area told them that nice people don't eat their relatives, whether they're dead or alive. And, and these people were eating their dead relatives to, uh, to really immortalize them. This was their way of immortalizing them through taking their soul, which they believed was in the brain, not in the heart. And the second thing that happened was that the Australian uh, authorities, who now began to occupy the highlands of New Guinea, which up until the late 1940s uh, were, had not seen any Western uh, people, uh, they began to occupy that area and they outlawed cannibalism. So that's how these tribes have now survived. I, I eat meat. Do you eat meat in English? The question was, do I eat meat? And I said, yes. And then Alan chimed in with, do I eat meat in England? And uh, the answer is not now. Is there any screening for blood, blood products? Uh, there's been a lot of uh, discussion about this. There are no acid. So the question is, is there any screening for blood or blood products? And right now, there's no reliable assay for prions in blood. And so what was done by the FDA was to first, about four years ago, put into an effect, if you had lived in the UK for, for six months or more, you could not give blood in the United States. And then last year, this was reduced to three months, and then it was something on the order of three years or four years for the rest of Europe. So this is a cumulative time that you've spent. And this, you get asked these questions when you give blood. Now, there's also a lot of interest at the level of the FDA and drug companies to carry out uh, analyses of their methods when they produce a biological, such as, uh, let me give you an example, uh, TPA for heart attacks or Herceptin for cancer treatment. These are biologics that are produced in cells. And when these kinds of drugs are produced, there's a lot of interest in analyzing whether there's any possibility that prions could be carried along with them. So this is going on now. Oh, some thought about prions and schizophrenia. I mean, I think that we're going to see many, many more diseases that are due to these changes in protein shape. And every disease for which we have no understanding is ripe for such a possibility. But beyond that, I think one can't speculate with any certainty. But I love to speculate. OK, so could I talk more about how understanding prions would be used to can benefit an understanding of Alzheimer's disease? So if one understands any of these degenerative diseases in great detail, the implications for understanding the others are immense. They're immense in terms of new ways of thinking about 
the control of protein shape and the control of protein processing, going from a normal form to an abnormal form, accumulating an abnormal form, causing, uh, as, as we had questions before about how do these changes in protein shape then uh, manifest themselves in neurologic signs and symptoms. Decreased thinking, decreased memory, uh, inability to walk. Um, what is the process by which this goes on? We have no idea. Uh, and so what we're seeing is as more and more information comes from all these neurodegenerative diseases about them and the mechanisms, we're going to see more and more cross-fertilization. The prion diseases have the advantages that, that we know much more about prions than we do about the process of Alzheimer's disease. We have much better animal models. These transgenic or genetically engineered mice reproduce every aspect of the prion disease of humans, of the cow, depending on what gene we express in the mouse. And so we have tools with prion diseases that we don't have with any of the other diseases. And I think if we're successful in the therapy in prion disease, uh, this will generate an enormous interest in the drug companies as well as the governments, as well as foundations throughout the world to put enormous amounts of more money into solving a problem like Alzheimer's disease, um, which is a growing and growing problem because of the change in demography of our populations. Um, when you're 85 years old, you have a one in three chance of having Alzheimer's disease. And as we have more and more people who become octogenarians, the number of people with Alzheimer's disease is going to keep going up. Other questions? So the question is, in, in late onset muscular dystrophies, where they have these expand mutations that expand the size of the protein, uh, or sometimes don't expand the size of the protein but expand the gene, uh, are there similarities? And the answer is yes. One of the diseases I put up, but I didn't talk about, was Huntington's disease. And then I put up some of the spinocerebellar ataxias. And these diseases have these same kinds of expanded repeats. And um, the answer is, I think we're talking about many similar phenomena. Now, in these cases, these are all inherited diseases, so it's only the genetic form of the disease. But we have no understanding of why it is that these diseases have such a late onset. What is clear is that the bigger the repeat, the earlier the onset. But then all of that has to be qualified by many other factors that shift these curves up and down with respect to the, to the repeats. In the prion diseases, we have absolutely no understanding why it is that a single, muta single mutation, meaning one amino acid has changed, some members of the family, the same family, are 40 years old when they get the disease, and others are 80 or 90 years old. The question is about these areas where PRPC is converted into PRP scrapie on the surface of the cell, these cholesterol-rich microdomains. One of the reasons we know they're cholesterol-rich is that with lovastatin and other drugs, we can completely abolish the formation of PRP scrapie. Now, we can't give that drug in high enough concentrations to humans because we would dissolve the human. Uh, the cells are not very happy in these very high concentrations of lovastatin. Uh, these are very important regions, these cholesterol-rich microdomains or rafts that people have been studying only for the last few years. They seem to coalesce and form caves or cavioli, and we really don't understand their function. But there are, there are more and more studies on, in this area, and I think you know, as time goes on, we'll understand much more about them. So the way the protein is multiplying is that we're seeing new PRPC being made all the time, and then it's being degraded. But about 5% of it in a scrapie-infected cell is being bled off into the formation of new PRP scrapie. And the old PRP scrapie, the existing PRP scrapie, drives the formation of new PRP scrapie. That's how a protein is multiplying. So again, that's the, sa the same answer that I gave. The question is, what's the relationship of scrapie to Parkinson's disease? 
So the same answer that I gave about the relationship of, of uh, prion research to Alzheimer's disease is the answer to what is the relationship to Parkinson's disease. As we learn more about all of the processes that occur in, in scrapie, in the prion diseases, those will translate into learning much more about Parkinson's disease. In Parkinson's disease, there is a protein called alpha-synuclein, which is normally made in all of us. And the disease, when the disease occurs, or even long before the disease occurs, alpha-synuclein is being mishandled, improperly handled, and starts accumulating not outside the cell as big plaques, but inside the cell as what are, in what are called Lewy bodies, and specifically in the cells of the substantia nigra, which are the cells that die out in Parkinson's disease. So there is a PRP in birds. It's very much different than mammalian PRP. And whether birds have prion diseases, I don't know. So the question is, is are, there trans, are there cases of CJD where they've, it's come from a vaccine or it's come from a blood transfusion? There are several cases where there have been blood transfusions, but one can't be sure that it either came from the blood transfusion or it was simply a sporadic case of CJD. Uh, and the same thing's true of a couple of vaccine cases. But, you know, the problem is everybody's vaccinated. And so we can't really make any relationship there. So the question is, since ALS is a relatively rare disease, is there much research being done here at UCSF? And the answer is that uh, there's a small amount of research being done here, but it's, but it's significant. And we have a clinical center, and in that clinical center, we're trying to get much more information. And we'd like to, ex we ho our hope is to expand ALS research in the near future. Stan, on behalf of uh, Minimed, thank you so much. Thank you.